And it really goes to prove that if you don't measure something, nothing will be done about it. And we have to make New Jersey's business climate more attractive for entrepreneurs. We are Wonder Women. Like, look at all these women and what they've done and what they've tried. And even if they didn't succeed, they gave it a shot. I don't think it's fair to put a four or five billion dollar price tag on middle class New Jerseyans. We've got a great lifestyle here and I don't want to see it ruined because politicians can't manage our finances properly. Hi, I'm Lisa Allen and this is As a Matter of Fact. Today we're filming from Hometown's TV studios in Summit, New Jersey. Thank you for joining us. Today, I'm here with Assemblyman John Bramnick, Republican Assembly Leader of New Jersey, representing Union, Somerset, and Morris Counties in the 21st District. Born and raised in Plainfield, New Jersey, John is a homegrown legislator, starting his civil service career as a Plainfield City Council member from 1984 to 1991. Over the course of his career, he's held high-ranking positions within the GOP and has been honored for his long list of achievements. And of course, if you know him personally, you know he holds the title of being the funniest lawyer in New Jersey. As a matter of fact, earlier this year, he partnered with Governor Cody and together, they hosted a bipartisan comedy night, raising money to fight Alzheimer's. Thank you for coming. Great to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Lisa. I appreciate you coming today. It's great. So Alzheimer's is not a funny topic, but you came together to raise some money. How, do, how was, we're going to jump to that, but how was that event? Well, we sold out the Stress Factory in New Brunswick, and actually, Governor Cody was pretty funny. Is he? And the owner of the Stress Factory performed, Vinnie Brand, mm -hmm. and I was the cleanup batter. But I was following <laughs> some tough competition. But what was important is bipartisanship. You know, we actually were in a room and everybody got along. So that's a big deal just in it unto itself. Yeah, it really is. And you know what? I want to talk about that. Um, but where I really want to start is you and growing up in Plainfield, New Jersey. You're from New Jersey. So obviously you're connected. You're passionate about the state. Um, and your parents were small business owners, entrepreneurs. They own their business for 50 years. I would like to know, growing up in Plainfield, having entrepreneurial parents, how did that form you early on? so that you became the person that you are today? Well, it's everything, actually. Mm -hmm. So my dad had a store, Lazar's. It was the old mom and pop stationery store. So up front, they sold cigarettes and candy. In the back, they actually sold novelties. In the middle were s supplies, like for offices. So my dad, this store was open seven days a week. Hmm. He would close on Sunday at 2 o'clock. Thursday night, he was open until 8 p.m. So you know, I come from this culture of like, you work seven days a week. So when you're sitting voting on issues in Trenton and you watched your dad run a store, and my mom, my mom actually was probably the most creative businesswoman. I, actually, when there was a women's movement, I went to law school uh, and there were 51% women in my law school class. Hmm. Uh, I never saw any issues, my mother was in charge. So when, when people yeah. would talk about discrimination, I didn't get it yeah. because my mother was the businesswoman. My father was a good businessman, but I compared my wife, and my mom was kind of like the boss. So it took me a long time to understand the women's movement because in my house, it we didn't need a women's mo movement. She was in charge. So, uh, but getting back to the store, so when you have seven or eight employees, and I stood next to him, and those, most of those employees were there for 25 or 30 years, uh -huh. my dad would tell me a couple things. He said, first, you're nothing without these employees, nothing. So when it comes to like employer-employee relationships, like in my law office, I have some of the same people for 30 years also. You have to treat people with respect, and they're more important than you are. You cannot run a business by yourself. Any successful business per person knows that. So that's the culture you come up with. You don't. You just think about working really hard and treat people with respect. It's not much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were surrounded? Now you're from Plainfield, New Jersey. Yeah. What was the community like back then? Well, that's really a good question. <laughs> I came from probably the most diverse community uh, in New Jersey and maybe in the country. You, we had everything in New Jersey. Uh, and the cultures all met at Plainfield High School. We actually had riots in Plainfield High School. And, but in essence, every walk of life was at Plainfield High School, from the wealthiest people at the country club to the kids who came to school with nothing. So I think that public school environment also helped me in terms of understanding people and cultures. And, you know, I'm not sure there's a lot of schools left like that. Right. What was the riot about? The riot was the 60s. Mm, so right. 
uh, in the early 70s. So in 1969, I was a uh, sophomore in high school. And within the first couple months, basically it was a black-white uh, issue, just like you had in the uh, urban centers at that point. Our school blew up in, in riots. And the school was closed for weeks at a time. Hmm. I actually was on the black-white student committee. Uh, we would meet and try to resolve issues. Uh, it, was a, it was exactly what you think about in the 60s. The, the town itself blew up in riots with the National Guard in the 60s. Hmm. So that's also a learning experience because, yeah. uh, but I don't know, I was never full of any heat. You know, to me, like, uh, regardless of what was going on around me, I, I don't know, maybe it's genetic, but I had an optimistic attitude that, you know, we can solve these problems. Sure, we can all get along. Maybe like Rodney King. Why can't we all get along? Right. <laughs> Well, and you know what? It was good that you had an optimistic view because then you became city council member mm -hmm. in, in Plainfield. Was it an uphill battle to win or did you win handily just being from well, Plainfield? I had come back from New York. Uh, I was a lawyer in the city of New York for the city of New York, started in the South Bronx as a lawyer. I came back to Plainfield and moved to my hometown and ran for city council, but mm -hmm. there were four wards. I happened to be in the ward that would uh, most likely elect a Republican, not guaranteed, so I actually, you know, it's cut up into four wards. I would have never been able to win the other three wards because they're mostly Democratic. And Plainfield, of course, now is all Democratic. But back then, I was able to win my ward. Part of it is growing up in town, going to Plainfield High School. My dad had a store for 40, 50 years. So mm -hmm. it was all. But the fact that it was a ward that was, let's say, uh, split yeah. is why I won. Yeah. I would have lost if it was all Democratic. What did you learn during those years? <clears throat> well, I learned about the urban center and the problems of the urban center. And when, you, when you're seven years on the city council and you're the minority, uh, you get a pretty good sense of problems in the urban center and how difficult it is to um, bring back business into the urban center. Mm -hmm. That's why when I'm in Trenton, I get a pretty good sense of what urban communities need because I live that. Uh, and consequently, I learned uh, also, once again, how to interact with people. Yeah. And that is treat them with respect. And if you treat everyone with respect and dignity and civility, you can get stuff done. Right. I, I, we were talking about this before the interview. It's a struggle across the country. You know, it starts at a local level. There's contentious races, even at a local level, all the way to the national level. Where do you feel like starting out in politics very early on, what has changed? to get to a point where we're at, where people just don't know how to talk to each other? Well, I'm gonna start with the media. The media, and I don't criticize the media for what they do, but let's look at reality. They need a story. Mm -hmm. To recite policy and discuss policy, nobody's gonna read that. They have to have one, they have to have A versus B. They need a story. And now with social media, the stories even have to be more significant. They have to have a more significant basis to them. They have to have controversy in them. So we start with the fact that the media needs controversy to sell the newspaper or the television show, which they do. Yeah. Then what that does, it creates polarization within the society because people go, are you with them or against them? Mm -hmm. uh, are you, do you watch Fox or do you watch MSNBC? Which is it? They're like this, well, I watch all of them, and CNN, oh, no good. Yeah. You have to be, as possible. they say, pigger puppy. Yeah. You know, pigger puppy. What are you? So that, you start with that. Then you have gerrymandering, which puts us in districts which are either Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. Very few districts, and we're talking about assembly districts in this state, are mixed. So now the legislators play to wings. So because you have a conservative district, well, you can't meet people in the middle, you gotta be conservative. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a liberal district, you gotta be liberal. So between gerrymandering, social media, which in my, my judgment mimics the media, mm -hmm. and you know, the atmosphere that is us versus them, it's not good. Right. It's actually, to me, it's a dangerous path we're going down. Right, because ultimately people want government to work. So it's a dichotomy. People want it to work, and at the same time, they're following the stories in the media that are most salacious, right? Well, they I, want government to work unless it's their issue. Mm -hmm. Then they want their issue, and that's it. So somebody once told me in Trenton, whatever you do, don't do anything. <laughs> because if you do something, whatever you do, someone doesn't like it. And most of the time, people like you until you disagree with them once. They don't like it anymore. You can have 10 years in the legislature. You could do a lot of good stuff. 
But if they say, oh, I didn't know Bram that didn't vote it like that, I'm done with him. Mm -hmm. They give you no chits, you know, no, my father used to say, if you look too closely at all your friends, you won't have any friends. Mm -hmm. You look too closely at every politician, which we're doing today, you won't like any of them. Right. Think about this, whether it be Chris Christie, whether it be Hillary Clinton, whether it be Donald Trump, whether it be de Blasio, Rudy Giuliani, everybody's bad now. Like, no one's going, you don't, you don't find the name unless you go in the past, like Governor Tom Kane. Of course, he's not under the microscope. Everyone's under the microscope, so now you don't like anybody, mm -hmm. which is destructive to our society. I mean, look, you look too closely at anybody, you're not going to like them. Right. Is government not working behind the scene as much as we think? Is it more optics? No, I, I think that state government mm -hmm. is working to a degree you know, because we see each other, we spend time with each other, and we basically get along with Democrats and Republicans in Trenton. Mm -hmm. The problem becomes is the constituents are falling into two categories. You know, they're either extreme on one side or extreme on the other, and that creates some issues for us getting things done because people are afraid to cross their wings. Mm -hmm. You know, that the wings are watching you more closely than the people in the middle. Governor Tom came once said that 70 percent of the people want us to govern from the middle. Yeah. I believe that. And I when I meet you. most people, they look at you like this. They're not crazy. <laughs> most people, they go like this, yeah, well, we can compromise. Yeah. But those aren't your loudest voices. Mm -hmm. I, I, there was a councilman in Plainfield years ago named John Campbell. Mm -hmm. And a woman came up to me and was just screaming and yelling and screaming. I knew she wasn't rational. And I said, you know, John, I can't listen to this. Thing. He goes, listen to me. She's the one that goes around and talks to everybody. That's the person you want to listen to. Oh, because the sane person, the rational person, isn't running around talking to other people. Right. It's the crazy people. Right. So the crazy people, you know, you actually have to be nice to them because they spend their whole day acting crazy. Yeah. And think about it. If in your life, mm -hmm. family, or in your business, if you didn't compromise, mm -hmm. you'd have no family, no business, and no job. So the people who say, don't compromise the government, what do they do in their life? Right. That's my question. What do you do? Well, let me ask you this, because I want to get to politics. Yeah, sure. Um, Jersey has big challenges ahead. I've been doing a lot of research about around the pensions, the health care. I've talked to several politicians mm -hmm. and business leaders. Sure. And now the transportation fund is broke, um, which I don't even know what that really means. Is it like zero or is it in debt? Because we've been borrowing. Both zero and in debt. <laughs> right. So we have payments we have to make. Yep. And it went to zero and went zero because no one did anything for 25 years. Mm -hmm. All right. So what are the biggest, so I would say those are the biggest challenges. What do you see as the biggest challenges in Jersey? And in 10 years from now, what do you see for our state? Well, the biggest challenge is taxes mm -hmm. because people will not stay here. They will leave, which they have done. They'll go to Florida where there's no state income tax. They'll go to Florida where there's no estate tax. They'll go to Pennsylvania because of basically lower taxes. So you have to start with major reforms now. How do you save money? Well, first, you have to definitely change school funding mm -hmm. because $32 billion is our total budget. If one-third of the $32 billion goes into education, let's say 13 or $14 billion, and you don't, you take that off the table, you don't look at it, you can't fix property taxes. Mm -hmm. So myself, the governor, and others have proposed some changes, like, for example, Jersey City and Hoboken have done really well but they're still, quote, Abbott districts getting funding. Mm. So people can buy a condo. How does that happen? Politics. Oh. <laughs> well, because what happens in the Democratic Party, they're able, the people from Hudson County, mm -hmm. are able to control enough votes that they don't lose their funding from the 13 or 14 billion, and they get millions, right? Mm -hmm. well, things have changed since the Abbott, de Abbott decision. Absolutely. So we need to start sending some of that money to some of our other communities, mm -hmm. whether it be Summit or Westfield or uh, Mountainside, and say, guess what? You should get some increase in funding because if you buy a condo uh, in Hoboken or, or Jersey City, for example, you may pay, and you may pay 800000 you may only pay 7000 in property taxes. Why? Because we're supplementing those towns. So we need a discussion, as the governor started, calling, he, he calls it the fairness formula. Yep. I'm calling it, let's just have a discussion on changing some of the, f the funding. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Now, you also have to reduce this platinum plan for benefits for, for state employees. Mm -hmm. 
billions of dollars can be saved if we just went down to what everyone else has, a Cadillac plan or less for gonna, state employees? It's going to be taxed anyway. So don't don't the unions want yeah, to Yeah, we're, we're going to get a penalty from the federal government because the plan's too generous. Right. Well, That's crazy. but once again, these are special interest groups. But state, if you ask a doctor, what's the best plan that will come into their office? There's no question. It's the state health plan, mm -hmm. which costs us billions. And sh we can use that money for either tax relief or we could use it to put money in the pension. Report just came out this morning, which said we are the worst in terms of our funding of state pension right. in the country. That's terrible. So people aren't going to get their pension. <laughs> Below Illinois, by the but way. But they won't discuss reforms. Yeah. Look, I'm not that partisan, but I got 28 members in the Republican caucus. They have 52 members in the state assembly, Democrats. Mm -hmm. If they don't want to discuss changing any of this, which is essential, and somebody's going to have to talk about it at some point, mm -hmm. I can't get it done because I'm not allowed to stand up on the floor of the legislature and go like this, excuse me, Mr. Speaker, I want to talk about pension reform. You can't. You're not allowed. Well, let me ask you about that. So if you have a bill, you can't introduce it? You can introduce it into the clerk's office. So you yeah. now have a bill. Right. It doesn't go anywhere, though. It sits in the clerk's office. They call that a Dracula bill. Won't see the light of day. I've got a number of those Dracula bills. So if you're the minority party, if you want a bill to be introduced on the floor. To be voted on. Voted on. Can't do it. When was the last time a Republican bill was voted oh, on? Oh, no, no. We okay. have Republican okay. bills, but they're not bills. <laughs> oh, yeah, we get Republican bills. Okay. As long as they don't change the status quo and yeah. change, you know, the real important issues, which are partisan in nature. Right. Okay. Which is school funding or changing the health benefits for state employees or changing the civil service laws. Um, that we have a whole bunch of bills that would have substantial impact on your taxes, your taxes. Right. So are we going to solve this problem? Because if we don't, I see Jersey going bankrupt. Is, do you see that? Well, in the private sector, we're probably already bankrupt. Yeah. But in the public sector, uh, we just continue to kick the can kick down, down the road. road. So the answer is the only time government acts is in a crisis. Mm -hmm. So I would say that at some point even the Democrats have realized when you can't pay the pensions or people are leaving in droves to Florida, and in my judgment they're already starting to do that, you start to accept reality. Now, we did get, and I'm happy that part of the negotiations by myself and the governor, we have a reduction and then the complete elimination of the estate tax. Right. Meaning, you ask any accountant, and they're telling their wealthy uh, clients, these are clients with big businesses, get out of the state, don't die here. Right. So I was happy we were able to do that, but it's all through compromise. And so there's always a bad part to that story. Yeah, well, and let me ask you this. So the estate tax is going to go away, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but now November on the ballot is going to be question two. And whether we allocate all that money from the 23 cent gas tax mm -hmm. to the transportation fund or not. If people vote no, does that mean we go back to the drawing board? Does it wipe out the 23 cent gas tax? No. No. No, what, it, it? what it's going to do, it's going to allow the people in Trenton to spend that 23 cents any way they want. In the general fund. Part of what we required during the negotiations is this has to be constitutionally dedicated. Mm -hmm. If any funding is not constitutionally dedicated, it can be stolen, yep. used by any administration for any purpose. Like, they're running for re-election. They just say, you know something, instead of raising taxes, instead of doing this, we're just going to borrow money from the Transportation Trust Fund. This stops the borrowing. Mm -hmm. The rhetoric that you hear is really disingenuous. And it's disingenuous because I want all the people who say uh, that, oh, under no circumstance should be a gas tax. Just tell me where we're getting the money from. For 25 years, uh, Democrats and Republicans did nothing until the fund ran out of money. Mm -hmm. So we were in a position, at least myself and the governor, to say, you want to do anything to gas tax? Give me a $100,000 reduction exemption for all senior citizens anytime they get any retirement money. No more state income tax up to 100000 That We wanted elimination of the estate tax, yeah. tax cuts for veterans, all of these things. And they walked away from the table and let it go broke. The Democrats would not give any tax cuts. So then what happened was after two months of where the projects were being shut down because we said we want these tax cuts, they came back to the table. That's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes a gas tax. I don't like it. Right. But as a leader and somebody who's responsible, 
My job was to get as many tax cuts as possible. I could have walked away and just played the political card. I could have got up there and said, yeah, I'm just going to vote no. But that's not my, as the Republican leader, I have a responsibility to fight for what I can fight for. And that's what I did. I'm proud of it. And I'll debate that against anybody, especially the people with the loudest megaphone. Right. So do we go, are we back in the black if we do in eight years from now? If we do this 23 cent gas tax, <laughs> well, gas tax and I don't think we, well, the problem with this is when you don't do anything since 1988, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, and, and every reporter, everyone who's written about this, said they could have done a penny a year, just stayed up with, and, and the prior administration, if they didn't steal the money and put it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But more importantly is, uh, I don't know what's going to happen eight years from now, but I can tell you that for the next eight years that we're paying off the debt, which we have to pay for. We're working on new projects. And, and look, there's a lot of things I would change in the law. I would change in terms of what we pay to do these road repairs. But send me some more votes. Right. I need a few more members. Right. All right. I mean, are we, I, I keep asking this question. Yeah. Everybody says it's solvable. It's solvable if we have the political will. Is it solvable to put the pensions back on track? Sure. Can we do it? Are we going to do it? Well, we did some pension reform, and the Democratic majority has said, we're done discussing pension reform, mm -hmm. period. We're not going to discuss anymore. Well, they control uh, the, 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 both the Speaker and the Senate President. Mm -hmm. So if we can't have a debate on changing and reforming pensions, it can't get fixed. But at some point, they have to. They have to. Yeah, you know, right. At some well, point, they run out of money. And the constitutional amendment, now it didn't go on the ballot this year, but Phil Murphy's running for governor for next year. He, when I interviewed him, he said that he wants the constitutional amendment back on the ballot without reform. <laughs> I'm sorry, laughing. <laughs> I like this. And he went, to, and he was at Goldman Sachs too. Yeah. Uh, that's a pure partisan play to the unions. Hmm. If you're going to require in a state that only has a 32 billion dollar revenue source, mm -hmm. that three or four or five billion dollars goes to fund the pensions constitutionally. That's what I told about. It would be dedicated to that, meaning that that would be paid before everything else. Well, what about things like health care? What about school funding? So you're taking one group, that means the employees who are receiving pensions or former employees, and you're saying that is our number one priority in the state. It will be paid before everything. So let's assume we have a crisis similar to Sandy, and we have to pay for relief mm -hmm. for people who have been injured or lost property. First comes pensions. Yeah. So it's just, it's just not common sense. So somebody who worked at Goldman Sachs, you know, who's a business person, right, who made money, and you're going to make that a prior priority over everything else, senior citizens, right. like this, disabled people, um, children in need at schools. No, nope. first is our pension. No, no. Let's talk about reforms where people come in the system, may have to pay a little bit more, mm -hmm. and some changes in terms of, uh, let's assume, because I know people get pensions, they only work for 10 years in a part-time position, and they got a pension. Right. I have one joke. How, how yeah, do you know I want a joke. How do you know you're in jerseys? It's because you're getting a pension and you don't know why. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think that's funny. All right. So, I, it's so funny I could cry, actually. Well, look, <laughs> most of these things will be solved when there's a crisis. Yeah. I feel late. like we are in a crisis in some ways. Well, I, well government, though, is only recognize a crisis when it's a, you know, like you, when, the, when they run out of money. Right. They right. recognize it a few months before. They just don't do anything until it's completely out of money. Why, why we as legislators ever went home when the Transportation Trust Fund was at zero? Right. Here's my question. Do you go home if your business is failing or do you stay at your business? So I'm like, why are we just down there? Just mm -hmm. You should be forced to stay there and fix it. Guess what? If they force us to stay there and you can't go home, mm -hmm. you'd fix it. You'd fix it. From a civilian perspective, how can we help encourage government to work? Well, first, the more educated you are as to the issues. Mm -hmm. And when I get calls and or letters that are well thought out, they're just not like mean-spirited. Because most people just write, you know, I hate you, you voted for this, I hate you. Then the other person writes, I love you because you voted for that. Mm -hmm. But when people write, somebody wrote to me yesterday, called me up and said, you know, really appreciate what you did on this, but can you call me about this fairness formula because I don't think it's fair. So I called her up and I said, okay, we're not going to get exactly what the governor wants, which is the same amount of money per student, mm -hmm. but we should have this discussion. And when I returned her call, she was reasonable about it. Right. So that's what you need. Call the legislators, learn the issues, talk about them, 
because the more people who are rational, mm -hmm. the more likely we can get something done that's in the middle. And that's where we have to end up, because you're never going to end up on, on the extremes of any issue. There's no, you're not going to have the votes for the extremes. Right. All right. It sounds like a group like the Supremes. Uh, no. You know, like this. We got the Supremes and we got the extremes. Mm -hmm. We have more extremes than Supremes. Yeah, yeah, we got to flip that. All right. All right, so we're in lightning round because we're wrapping up. I'm getting the two-minute signal, so I have some questions. Are this you ready? This is like a football, okay. I know, you ready? Like I'm like the quarterback. These are pretty important questions. Yeah. What's your favorite sandwich? I would say turkey on rye toast. All right, every day? Oh, no. Okay. You don't want, any, you don't want anything every day. Um, what's your favorite time of day? About 4.30 in the afternoon. Why? 5 o'clock. Because, you know, you wrapped up the day, you know, depending on the time of year, the sun's setting. I love that late after. I don't like 2 o'clock yeah. p.m. I don't like that. I like 6 in the morning. I like 6 in the morning or like 4.30 to 6.30 at night. All right. I don't like 3 in the afternoon. I'm the most tired. I don't like 12 noon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 12. I'm not a big 12 noon person. What's going on at 12 noon? Uh, what can't you a shootout in, in a western town. Right. What can't you live without? Probably my family. Probably my wife and kids. You know, that that's the... You know, because without that, you're just kind of a nomad in my day. You're nothing. Right. Okay, last question for you. You are into interpersonal. Um, you want to write a big, book? Big time. Big I'm writing time. a book now. All right, so I believe in habits. Habits are the point of where you're a success or a failure in life. So what habit do you do every day that makes you a success? Try to be really respectful of other people and think about them first. That's number one because when you have to think about their perspective, not your perspective. If you think about your perspective, you can't hear what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So you got to figure, like for example, not being late. Like I am compulsive being early. Why should you wait for me? I stopped doing six things, so I got here by eleven o'clock today. Actually, ten of it, ten of eleven. But somebody else comes after 10 after 11 and goes, you know, I'm so sorry I hit traffic. Let me just tell you something. Never use the excuse you hit traffic in New Jersey. If you don't know there's traffic in New Jersey, you got a problem. You should go right. back to high school. Right. So my point is being on time. Especially with a broken you? transportation fund. Yeah, well, well, the roads no, are <laughs> Absolutely. We knew that. Uh, but my question to you is, yeah. why should you, why should you have to wait for me? Mm -hmm. There are exceptions, very few, but I can right. call and say, listen, I meant to get here. This is what happened, et cetera, and not traffic. But that's the thing. You want, you want to get me crazy? Come 15 minutes late to some lunch that you asked me to join you, mm. and you didn't get I, Can I tell one story? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so I had an aide. <laughs> George W. Bush was coming to Westfield a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And you have to get there, let's say, at 10 o'clock. At 10.15, the Secret Service locked the door. Secret Service come up to me and say, Assemblyman, your aide just got here. Should we let him in? I said, fire him. He said, well, we don't fire people. My point is, no. Yeah. Wait a minute now. You know, unless there's a real exception, why, how disrespectful is that to everybody? Mm -hmm. I, well, you, you got me on a I'm bad you. one. You got me on a bad one. Get there five minutes early, you're, you're on time. Well, I, I, right? Well, if you're on time, but, you're late. But I'm doing that because I respect you. Well, I'm, so I should do two more things. I should go to the bank, go to the dry cleaners, and then try to get here at 11? Wrong. Mm. Do you have a joke about being late? No, because I don't <laughs> find it that funny. You know what I mean? Like, I got a joke right to the moon. You know what I mean? Right, right. to the no, I, and that's, you know, but And this interpersonal skills thing, okay. it's all about really thinking about what is the other person's perspective. You know, that, that's, the, that's the key. Uh, that's the habit. Right. Well, they learned it here. Leadership lesson from Assemblyman John Bramnick. Don't be late. No, don't be late. Don't no be good. late. Don't be late. That's what we tell people. All <laughs> right. So we're going to wrap it up here. We, I had a great time having a good Thank discussion. You. Next time you're going to come back and interview me. Um, uh, we can do that. All right, because you used to do a show here. So What bugs you? Yeah. That's what don't we want to know. Started. Go ahead. Tell everybody. Ask my husband. Maybe you should interview my tell, husband. Tell everybody. Yeah. Go ahead. What's the um, secret? No secrets here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to Assemblyman John Bramnick for joining me today, as well as our viewers on As a Matter of Fact. I'm Lisa Allen, and we're filming from Hometown TV Studios in Summit, New Jersey. To find out about more shows like these, please visit our website, www.hometowntv.org, or visit our Facebook page at Hometown Television. See you next episode on As a Matter of Fact. Mm -hmm.